Okay, hi, uh, I'm Boris. This talk is about TLS receive side offflow of crypto to uh, network interface controllers. Uh, so we'll start with some uh, background about uh, TLS. Uh, TLS has a record protocol that carries application data. So the user provides its data, which is then uh, being segmented into those records of 16K. Afterwards, uh, the data is encrypted in these chunks where an authentication tag is being gathered. Finally, uh, the TLS record header is added and those records are sent over the wire, for example, using TCP, where it's uh, segmented uh, to MSS-sized units. Uh, so about TLS crypto offload, ideally uh, packets would be processed independently, such as the case for IPsec and DTLS, for example. Uh, however, in TLS, each record is uh, processed independently uh, with a small caveat where there is an out-of-band TLS sequence number, TLS record sequence number, that is also required for decryption. Um, so the NIC requires to maintain some state. Uh, this state uh, is needed to process uh, the next packet. So state from the previous packet is required to process the next packet of the same record. <coughs> OK, so, so motivation in, in the previous uh, native talk, I've presented the transmit side uh, TLS script offload. So we've made some performance measurements, and I hope it would serve for motivation to perform Rx crypto offload as well. So what we've done, we, have uh, we had a setup of two Xeon machines connected back to back using NIC that supports TLS-TX crypto offload, uh, called the, the Nova TLS. Uh, and we ran iperf with a patch that makes it use OpenSSL to get the handshake up, and then you can send data. Uh, and we compared the following data paths. Uh, the first is OpenSSL with SSL read and write, which are the APIs to send and receive data using the OpenSSL library. Second is kernel TLS with send and receive uh, with offload. The receive is without offload, but the send is using uh, offload. Uh, and the, the final one is the TCP send and receive. We compare here TCP just to get an upper limit to how much can we improve uh, in this offload. Uh, and everything has been normalized to OpenSSL, so I'll explain the graph now. So on the x-axis, we have a record size, and we present our single record size, which is the, the most interesting one, the maximal record size of OpenSSL, which, which is 16K. And on the y-axis, we have speed up, uh, which is normalized to the OpenSSL performance. So, so here on the left, we have the OpenSSL performance, which is one, uh, the normalized one. Uh, in the middle, we have the KTLS with offload, uh, which is 3.1. And uh, on, the, on the, left the leftmost one is uh, vanilla TCP. Uh, the, uh, the measurement here is the bandwidth uh, divided by CPU utilization. The reason we use this measurement is because bandwidth just doesn't improve. The bottleneck is the receive side, which is doing crypto in this 100% CPU. Um, so we hope that we could show bandwidth if we had the receive side offload, and we would get 3x bandwidth, more or less. So this is our motivation here. OK, so KTLS is now upstream. We have a user space API to provide uh, users with TLS inside the kernel with the TLS data path. Currently, it's only the send side, but we, we envision the receive side as well. Uh, the user space today is that we start with the TCP connection. You probably can't see this, but I'll explain anyway. Uh, you start with the TCP connection. You open a socket, as you usually do. Uh, then uh, uh, TLS is enabled using the socket option, uh, which replaces the send functions to TLS send functions, which eventually called the TCP send functions. So the extension to the receive side is uh, relatively similar. We had an additional socket option for the receive side uh, with TLS RX socket option, and it replaces the TLS receive side functions, uh, the TCP receive side functions with TLS receive side functions. 
So here we have an example, but you probably can't see. Okay. So the model of crypto float is qu quite similar in the receive pi uh, side to the transmit side. W we, in the initialization phase, we provide all the crypto material, the five tuple, a TCP sequence number of the next TLS record, and its corresponding TLS record sequence number. Uh, those are provided uh, through KTLS to hardware, eventually. And what hardware is going to do is it's going to And we are going to decrypt the payload of uh, in order incoming packets uh, and those only. So headers of these packets remain unmodified. However, the payload is, is being processed and decrypted. So it's a pair packet indication of whether it was processed or not. Out of order packets are unmodified. So we're going to have both ciphertext and plain text uh, packets traveling up the stack. And it's a challenge we're going to solve, and I'm going to talk about it in the next slides. Uh, the software stack is mainly unchanged. The KTLS is just without crypto, TCP IP, congestion, memory control, and everything else is just the same. Uh, however, we have these two additional bits to the SKB that describe w what was done to, to each packet, and I'm going to touch about it a little bit more later on. So about the data path, we, we have a fast path and we, we have a slow path. So the fast path is that when everything is, has been processed, all packets have been decrypted of each record, and uh, this code is it's running in KTLS. Uh, so it looks at the record, it sees everything is decrypted, it copies to user space, and everything is good. Now for the, for the slow path. So the slow path is in two parts. For the first part is what if some of the record is decrypted, but not all of it. So, so say offload was uh, skipped the packet for some reason, or, or maybe it just stopped in the middle of a stream, and from that moment onward, nothing is offloaded. S so what we have here is, for example, as we show uh, at the bottom, that TLS record two is what we call partially decrypted, or when one packet of this, or some packets of this record, but not all of them, have been decrypted. So we need to do what we call partial decryption, and that's an algorithm that handles this situation and provides user space with the plain text after authentication. And we are going to touch on that uh, in one of the following slides. The other part of uh, the slow path is what we call resynchronization. When we get a TLS record that is fully ciphertext, that is, the entire record is hasn't been processed by hardware, uh, it means that hardware lost state and it cannot perform TLS uh, offload anymore. So it requires some additional information from software to, to be provided in order to, to get it m its uh, machine running again. And for that we need the, the KTLS layer to call the driver with a resynchronization function to provide that metadata. So going back to partial decryption, how partial decryption works. So uh, here we present the partial decryption algorithm uh, with a small uh, asterisk uh, up here that this algorithm is somewhat simplified to, to help explain it better. Uh, it does two passes on the data and an optimized algorithm could do it with a single pass. And if anyone is interested, I, I can talk about that later. So uh, how we do it is that we are going to re-encrypt the TLS record, and then once we have the encrypted TLS record, it's going to be uh, decrypted and authenticated in software as we usually do. So to re-encrypt the TLS record, we need to take this packet, which was decrypted by hardware, and reverse the operation. And how it's done, for instance, for AES-GCM, which is a counter mode cipher, is via, via XRO with the, with the key stream. So the key stream could be generated simply by encrypting zeros with the correct IV. The, the IV is no, it's plain text in the TLS record. So we generate the key stream and then we XOR the uh, decrypted packet, the plain text packet, to obtain the, the ciphertext. So we XOR the plain text with the key stream, we obtain the ciphertext and we get the full ciphertext record, which is decrypted and authenticated. 
and the plain text could be provided to the user after authentication. So about resynchronization, uh, after some packet uh, is dropped or some packets arrive out of order, hardware loses the following state, which is required to, to keep offloading TLS. Uh, we lose the location of TLS records inside the TCP stream, the, the framing of TLS, and we lose the TLS record sequence number for each frame. So we need some assistance from software. In the resynchronization process, KTLS require, uh, requests the driver to synchronize for each record received, which is still fully encrypted, which hasn't been processed. Uh, it provides the TCP sequence number of that record and the TLS uh, record sequence number uh, accordingly. And the driver attempts to synchronize hardware, and hopefully, eventually, it would be get resynchronized. Uh, it's important to know that while hardware is out of sync, it will not attempt to decrypt anything or to do any additional processing and until software confirms resynchronization. Okay, so uh, one of the challenges we have with initialization is that we have this, uh, some s in some sense, it's a race condition. Uh, when we want to start offload, we need to provide the most up-to-date state for the, the type of processing of data received by NIC hardware. So uh, when the user says, I want you to start offloading now, it has seen the TCP byte stream uh, up to some, uh, I don't know, X bytes. Uh, the TCP stacks seen a little bit more. It, it say it read Y bytes, which is greater than X. And the NIC has seen even more, it's uh, seen Z bytes, greater than Y and X. So hardware needs to get Z, but software could provide it from user space only with X, say. So we suggest two mitigations. The first is uh, when the user requests offload, we could provide Y from the KTLS layer just by walking the receive queue of TCP and seeing where there are records and providing the, the newest one. And the, the other is the resync flow in hardware where it needs to, to help out in case w we have Z that is greater than Y. Another challenge occurs in uh, TLS cipher renegotiation. So here we show the stages of the TLS handshake, but I'm not going to walk through it. What's important here is that th there are two parts, two essential parts. Uh, uh a part where you use the old key and a part where you use the, the new key. So uh, all the handshake of course using the old key at until a change cipher spec message is sent. This message says that all following message will use the new key. Uh, so here we show wha what's using the old keys and what's using the new keys uh, in both sides, in the client and the server, uh, in a full handshake of TLS. So uh, now that we know that everything after a change cipher spec is using the new keys, w what's the challenge? So assume all packets are received in order, uh, and we have a TLS renegotiation going on. Uh, however, hardware, it didn't identify the change cipher spec message, and now, uh, as a result, it processed the uh, packets of uh, that, are that were encrypted using the new key, using the old key. And it got an error, an authentication error, since it's not the right key. So how can we handle that? What we suggest is that when KTLS observes the change cipher spec message, it would go, uh, it would stop hardware offload, obviously, since it's not helping, and it will go over all packets received and re-encrypt them, since they weren't decrypted using the right key. So here we, we show an example of such a thing where uh, records one and two were encrypted using the old key and records three and four were encrypted using the new key. However, hardware decrypted these three packets, five, six, and seven, using the old key, which is wrong, and it needs to be fixed somehow. So to summarize, we, we had a few problems and we suggested some solutions. So the first problem was that during initialization, hardware al already processed some TLS record that hasn't been seen by software. And we solve it using resynchronization and some kernel assistance in processing TLS records. Uh, the second problem was where during uh, 
normal data sent uh, some packet drop or reorder occurred and the hardware is out of sync, so we solve it using the resync flow. Third, uh, when TLS renegotiates keys, uh, some data might be decrypted using the old key and we solve it using re-encryption in the KTLS layer. Uh, and finally, uh, if offload stops in the middle of, re of record or skips some packets, then we get partially decrypted records and we need to handle that. And we have the partial decryption algorithm for that. So some points for discussion. Uh, we need to pass two bits of metadata in the SKB. Uh, first, if any crypto was done. Uh, and second, if it was successful. Um, so this might, might not be trivial to, to add in bits of data to, to the SKB. Another problem is that we need to prevent coalescing at all kinds of layers between ciphertext and plain text SKBs. Uh, for example, TCP coalesce or GRO must not coalesce ciphertext and plain text data. And uh, this, this leads us to the next challenge where the TCP uh, out of order queue might get bloated with those plain text ciphertext, plain text ciphertext uh, SKBs. Uh, so th there are all kinds of solutions. Wha one is to re encrypt everything, one is to try to decrypt everything. Uh, whenever possible to, to merge those SKBs whenever there's pressure. Um, another point is what happens when we have crypto which was done, however it wasn't successful. Assume you have one TCP packet with multiple TLS records inside and one of them had an error. Say the authentication failed or it, it's not even TLS. TLS stopped at some point and now you have TCP. So uh, what we suggest in such cases that Hardware obviously the, the it provides only those two bits of information that saying I I've processed it but I had some error, so KTLS could call the driver and the driver could reverse the operation and provide the original packet uh, for such an occasion. Uh, finally, TLS uses checksum unnecessary. We must process TCP. We must know how TCP it was correct. We can't process packets that had the wrong checksum. So if we already checked the checksum and we've done everything. Checksum complete uh, might not be as meaningful. Moreover, the TCP checksum that's been provided is provided over the ciphertext, and it, it has no ciphertext, it's only plain text. So what does this number mean when you provide checksum complete? It's, it might be a little bit weird. Um, so any, any questions or comments? I think that's the last slide. I only worry about the, the lack of checksum complete for optimizing uh, tunnel encapsulation situations, right? Because we have that optimization where you can use a zero checksum on the inner if you have a checksum complete on the, I mean, on the outer if you have a checksum complete on the inside. So you might want to take this into consideration because log logically the checksum, you have it, right? Logically. But with for the data that's in the SKB now, it doesn't match up anymore. So maybe there's some way we can represent that and still use the value somehow, just a suggestion. I'll need to think about it. Cur currently, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure. W this is fine for now, just thinking ahead. Okay. Okay, thank you. I noticed in uh, reading the KTLS source that uh, at no place do you uh, call mem0 explicit on any uh, secret keys. I'm wondering if this was a conscious decision not to zero keys out and what the security reasoning is or if it's just a, a simple oversight and if you'd accept patches to add that or uh, just what your mentality is on, on key zeroing. Well, generally keys are always required to perform the, the encryption and decryption live uh, currently, in the upstream, what you've probably seen is software KTLS, where you must have keys all the time. Uh, what, what I'm, yeah, I'm referring to this, but what I mean is when you, uh, when you pass a key into the kernel, um, it, usually it's important to then zero out the key when you're done using it. You, so you're not it done using memory. it. The, the issue is that you're constantly using those keys I, I, in the kernel. Uh, but so I mean, at the end of a TLS session, you're done using it? And oh, it's usually oh. important to zero it out so that you have ephemeral security. So that you yeah, have for so sure. secrecy. So send patches, yeah, if you don't zero it on destruction, so it makes sense to zero it out. Sure. All right, I'll send patches.
Okay. So the resync processing sounds kind of expensive in the case of packet loss. Have you measured at what rate of packet loss essentially this becomes perhaps more burdensome than simply doing it completely in software? No, we, we plan to do such measurements. We, we actually plan uh, uh, an extensive paper on the subject, an academic paper, and w we intend to study those problems. Uh, it really depends on how much uh, we can optimize the software paths and how much do they cost compared to the half hardware offload paths. Uh, so with 1% uh, packet drops, you would probably get 16% of, uh, about 16% of TLS record that goes to through the software path. Uh, say you had only one packet drop and how to skip and somehow keep offloading. S so uh, it's going to be about that, but then it depends how much this 16% is going to cost. Maybe it's already too much and it's not worth it. W we need to do those measurements, definitely. Thank you. Just the added comment. Um, so in wireless, when we do, um, where's that, the hands up? Like um, like ping pong, I mean, there's a lot of like uh, out of sequence packets coming. Um, so it would be really good to actually see like, you know, the impact of the, um, uh, what is it, the, um, you know, uh, the packet reordering uh, rate on the performance of, uh, you know, the hardware uh, offload. Right, so, so we need to do those measurements, definitely, yes. Let's give a warm applause to our buddy, Bro Boris. Thanks.